Good morning. Um, this is Dolores Andrew Gavin and welcome to another episode of Irish Health Hour Chats. And this morning I'm delighted to be interviewing Martin Quinn, who is a community activist and a stroke survivor. Martin, welcome. Thank you very much, Dolores. Glad to be with you. Yeah, I mean, your story is a very inspirational one, um, and I know that it will be of, of great interest to many people in the Irish Health Hour community. So I suppose what I'd love to start with asking you, Martin, is um, can we talk a little bit about, or you talk a little bit about before you had your stroke, what life was life like for you, so that we can compare where you are now to where you were, if that's okay with you? Yes, indeed. Um, I suppose uh, you mentioned there about community activism and indeed my whole life uh, really since I was a young boy has been involved in community. Um, I come from a place called Bansa, uh, which is uh, in the South Tipperary, near Tipperary town and uh, it's a great community. You know, it has a, a great community history. Um, Canon Hayes, who founded the community development organization Wint Natira, uh, is buried in Bansa. He spent the last 11 years of his life as parish priest of Bansa. And uh, there was a lot of initiatives, I suppose, uh, that he pioneered, including rural electrification, which were rolled out when he was parish priest of Bansa. Uh, so Bansa has a great history, I suppose, of, of community. And I think a lot of us can be attributed back to Canon Hayes during his time uh, in Bansa in the late 40s and uh, into the 50s. And uh, I suppose it has carried on through a lot of people, actually. There are quite a number of well-known, I suppose, people from Bansa, uh, including John Lunnigan, the former governor of Mountjoy Prison, uh, John is a native of the parish. Um, in music circles, uh, Louise Morrissey would be very well known okay. uh, through country music. She's also from Bansa. And uh, the uh, jockey and trainer, Christy Roach, uh, who's based there at the Cora, uh, who's recently handed over the mantle to his son, uh, he's also a Bansa man. So quite a lot, I suppose, uh, of community, community. Wow. <clears throat> That's great to hear, Martin. How about the any? Uh, have you any Tipperary hurlers coming from Bantra? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we we have no Tipperary hurlers, I suppose, uh, uh, from from the the parish, uh, the club, which is Galtier Rovers, Saint Pecan's GA Club, would have been very much associated with football. Okay. So it would have been predominantly a football club. Now, we do have hurdlers, and we did win a West Championship, which was the first time in its history there a number of years ago. Uh, but we don't have any senior hurdlers at the moment. Sorry, I ask because I'm a big Galway hurling fan myself. <laughs> yes. And my late dad, um, Larry Quinn, uh, would have played junior hurling for Tipperary. Okay. and. Uh, was a very good hurler and, and footballer himself. That's lovely, so, Martin. It sounds like such a, a great place to live. I mean, the community spirit really is so wonderful to have, isn't it? I mean, especially at yeah. times like this. At the moment, while I'm interviewing you, we're um, locked down almost in the country with snow. So I That's think right. that, um, that, that community comes into play very much in times like this when we need to... Well, we hope we can rely on each other as well. So that's great to hear. So you were always involved in community activities... Yes, and, yes and, and you mentioned there about um, the snow and the lockdown and we're near the Glen of Vaharlo and the Galtee Mountains and uh, it's very picturesque but it is uh, very much in lockdown here as well. And, uh, you know, I mentioned about Winton Atira, the Community Development Organization, which was founded back in 1937 by Canon Hayes. And that organization is very much involved uh, now with uh, uh, care of the elderly. They do the community alert, if you've ever heard of community alert, uh, sure. text alert, that's an initiative of Winton Atira. And I myself uh, was very honored, I suppose, to be national president of Winton Atira. I spent three years 
as national president of Winston Atira. So I'm very, uh, I'm very much, I suppose, in the community genre, you know, that that's where I've got my inspiration from. And uh, that's what I've continued to do over the years through many different uh, voluntary organizations. And you were um, recognized for your contribution as well, weren't you? You got a, a wonderful prestigious award in your, in your local town of Tipperary. Yes, uh, it was uh, the Tipperary Association uh, Dublin. Because uh, they honoured me with uh, the Tipperary Person of the Year for 2012. Uh, it was uh, to honour and to recognise my community work. And my work, I suppose, as well with the Tipperary International Peace Award. Mm. Uh, it's a very prestigious award. And uh, that will bring me on, actually, to sure. my story of how I happened to suffer a stroke. Yes, um, I was reading that. So yes, please do take us on. And it's very interesting. It's wonderful that you're involved in this the whole piece and the story is wonderful. So it's over to you. Yes, the Tipperary International Peace Award uh, was, I suppose, um, an initiative that came from uh, a group of people in Tipperary. I wasn't involved uh, in the early 80s when it was founded. Um, because of the song, it's a long way to Tipperary, uh, Tipperary being associated with a, a World War song. Uh, they felt it was, would be important to try and uh, associate Tipperary with peace. And so the Tipperary Peace Convention was founded. And over the years, we've presented an annual peace award. It has gone uh, to people like the late Nelson Mandela, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Bill Clinton, um, uh, also people like Bob Geldof got the award for his humanitarian work and uh, over the years then a lot of people from Northern Ireland that would have worked closely with peace agreements in Northern Ireland including Senator uh, George Mitchell would have got the award and uh, in recent years then we would have had people like Ban Ki-moon um, Malala, Malala Yousafzai. Uh, last year it was the Syrian civil defence white helmets who were doing extraordinary work, particularly in Syria now, which is uh, such a terrible situation there. And the Syrian civil defence white helmets are doing fantastic work. So they got the award last yeah. year. Yes. So I suppose I'll take you back to when Malala got the award. And um, we had decided, as probably everybody uh, that is watching and listening would know, that Malala Yousafzai was a Pakistani teenager and who was shot in the head by the Taliban. Uh, she was, uh, I suppose, very active in, in blogging about rights for young girls and for women. And uh, the Taliban uh, didn't like what she was writing and doing. And they boarded her bus, which was taking her to her school. And the school, they had to be uh, not publicly, they couldn't go to a public school. So it was uh, in secret, if you like, that they were being schooled. Uh, but the Taliban got word of it and they boarded the school bus and they singled her out and they shot her in the head. Mm. And miraculously, she survived uh, the assassination attempt. And she ended up in the hospital in England, in Birmingham, and she made a fantastic recovery. And uh, uh, after that period, around that time, uh, the Tipperary Peace Convention, we decided on um, giving her the award for the great work that she was doing in trying to raise awareness for uh, young people and women's rights. And uh, then, of course, she got shot in the head. And um, she, uh, we were announcing uh, the details of it. We were announcing that she was going to get the award. And I was entrusted, uh, as I do every year, with making the announcement. And I went uh, on my local radio uh, 
Tipperary Midwest uh, radio to make the announcement. And I was introduced by uh, Joe Price, who was uh, interviewing me. And uh, I'd actually taken a phone call from Joe because I wasn't in the studio. So I was uh, at my office at work. I worked at that time as uh, an assistant supervisor on a community employment scheme. And uh, I took the phone call from Joe, went out to the car, and Joe introduced me. And when he asked me to announce the details of the award, I got stuck. I just couldn't uh, say what I wanted to say. Just would wow. not. Isn't that incredible, Martin, how just how quickly uh, yes. that you could actually feel it coming over, uh, over you, obviously, because you, if you were at work in the morning, you know, did you feel yes. well? And yes, it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I'd gone into work. It was just after Christmas. It was the 7th of January and uh, I chatted to my colleague now. He did say to me afterwards that he thought maybe that that I was a little vague or something, but he okay. didn't really notice anything major, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I went in to the office, I felt fine. I got up fine, everything. But uh, suddenly when I went to speak, I couldn't. The words just wouldn't come out. Okay. Um, I did a bit, I'd say, of, of maybe owing and ang, you know, trying to force the words mm. to come out. And then I did get um, some sentences together. Some sentences came out together. Now, it wasn't uh, terribly coherent. Uh, um, you could understand this, but it sounded like it, as if it was mixed up, you know, as if what I was saying didn't make a full sense, you know. So okay. Joe asked me a second question and the very same thing happened again. I just couldn't answer and then the words came out again. So he cut the interview short and um, I just sat in the car for a moment, a couple of moments, and I thought, you know, what's after happening to me? You know, I knew that the interview hadn't gone the way I wanted it to go. But if you asked me there and then what was wrong about the interview, I wouldn't have been able to answer. You know, okay. I, just, I just couldn't, I suppose, comprehend um, what was happening. And I got out of the car. Uh, I knew uh, that I wanted to go home. That was my abiding kind of memory. I just wanted to go home. And uh, I got out of the car, I went into the office, and I locked it up. My colleague had gone away, and I locked up the office, and I came back out. Now, I did ask the caretaker about the, the office codes, you know, which he thought was a bit unusual, because I would know the codes off the top of my head, you know. So okay. yeah, um, interesting. And, but I got back into the car, and believe it or not, uh, Dolores, I drove home. Wow. And I didn't realize, I suppose, what was happening to me. It was a short journey uh, to my home. So I, um, thankfully, I got home safely. Other people that I didn't uh, do any damage or crush into anybody, I got home and I got out of the car and I just went in home and I just kind of threw myself down on the, on the couch. I'm and sorry, Martin, for interrupting, but do you remember that journey home in the car? Is it something that you recall quite vividly, or is it something that is kind of evasive to you? And it is evasive to me. You know, I, I, I don't remember the journey home at all. So it's like your uh, body, you're, you know, you automatically kicked in. You're so used to this journey. Yeah. And luckily, yeah. it was a journey that was close and that you were obviously so well used to doing that it was like you were almost on automatic pilot. That's right, yes. And thankfully, yeah. as you say, that it went um, yes. smoothly for you. Yeah. I have uh, two daughters and either of them weren't at home. I was going to be home alone. Uh, in fact, they were coming home uh, during the afternoon, 
but they were going to be gone away that night, as it turned out. And uh, so I was going to be home alone, if you like. Now, they did come in and out uh, during the uh, day because uh, both of them would have been at school, college uh, age. And um, one of them was doing um, a placement, actually, from her school, from her college. So they did come in in the afternoon and they did ask me, was I okay and everything because I was on the couch at home and they wondered why I wasn't at work. And I did say to them that I just felt a bit unwell and, uh, you know, that I was okay and not to worry or bother. You know, I did have a very bad uh, pain in my head, but it wasn't like a headache. It was right at the top of my head. You know, it was kind of down through my head, a piercing pain. And uh, I didn't know what was what was the reason? I knew it wasn't a migraine or, you know, a pain like that. But, um, you know, very foolishly, I have to say now, you know, I didn't make any fuss or bother with my daughters. In fact, quite the opposite. And uh, they came back because they were a bit concerned. And I did the same thing again with them. I told them that I was fine and told them, the Christmas tree was still up and I told them I was taking down the Christmas tree and I started to do that. So from their point of view, you know, I seemed to be okay, you know, and it didn't seem to be anything too serious. But when they were gone, I immediately went to bed and um, I, I my bedroom is upstairs in, in the home and uh, I went upstairs to bed and really I suppose I I had a very unsettled, disturbed kind of sleep. You know, I had a lot of kind of uh, nightmares and, you know, very disturbed, waking a lot and very uncomfortable. And um, when, I, when I eventually woke in the morning, uh, I picked up my phone to try and uh, to let my colleague know that I would be into work and I couldn't focus on the phone I just couldn't okay. see see anything I couldn't send a message or anything like that and I had to um, when I attempted to to stand I wasn't able to stand on ages you know so I had to kind of get down on my backside and try and make my way down the stairs uh, to get into the sitting room kitchen. And I thought if I get into the uh, kitchen, I'd be able to phone because we had to have a bigger phone, you know, but the numbers were much more clearer. Oh, good Lord. That I'd be able to see the the phone numbers. Sure. Uh, I uh, did that. And after a few attempts, I did manage to ring the doctor. But of course, very foolishly again, I didn't tell the receptionist what was wrong. I just said to her, could you get uh, my doctor to ring me, get Dr. Hanrahan, who is my GP, to ring me? And uh, she said she would. So it was my daughter has actually arrived back um, in the afternoon from her placement and uh, she was immediately concerned when uh, she saw me and she realized that I was a lot worse than I was uh, when she had left that evening. So at all that time, Martin, is that something that um, the time between the first symptom you had on the radio and the following day, was that a crucial time that you could have yeah. got help? Yeah. I allowed all that time to elapse. You know, the guess part of it, Dolores, is that um, I, in my previous life, I was a presenter on the same radio station. So people would know me very well. They would know that I was very articulate, you know, that, um, that I was well able to, to talk and everything. And 
if I got a euro afterwards for everyone that said to me, well, we knew that there was something wrong with you, but okay. it's no pass. Yeah. Uh, but yes, nobody sent a text or a message or anything like that. And, you know, if somebody had contacted me, the chances are that I probably would have gone a lot quicker because I would have understood then that people realized that I wasn't well when I was on air because I wasn't able to, to comprehend, I suppose. I didn't really understand um, what way I sounded on air. Absolutely. You know? So there's never any self-judgment to yourself um, for, yes. you know, I mean, obviously if you're going through an episode like this, I mean, none of us know if we've never been there before. Um, gosh, uh, what a journey for you. Yes. So you got help then, I presume, your, your daughter I looked after did, you. The, the doctor rang actually uh, fairly soon after that and he had to uh, he had to ask me to put my daughter on the phone because I couldn't really explain okay. to him. My speech and everything was impaired at that stage and uh, I, I couldn't. And then he, he said to my daughter uh, to try and get us into hospital as quickly as possible mm -hmm. or to get somebody to come even and collect me. And, you know, I still didn't really fully realize what was going on. But, you know, um, when I thought about it back afterwards, you know, I, I I was attempting to stand up and I was banging into things, of course, and my daughter was telling me not to, you know, and I was trying to get things ready to go to the hospital, you know. And yeah. uh, even um, my sister uh, had... One of my sisters had died uh, a few months previously. She had uh, got cancer and died rather quickly within a short period of time. And uh, she that had happened just uh, shortly before I got the stroke. And um, I kept looking for my sister. Oh, dear. Mm. And my daughter had to say, to me that Mary died, you know, Mary died because I kept looking for her to bring me to the hospital, you know, and it, like it wasn't till then that I realized, you know, I'm really in trouble here, you know, yeah. and um, when I got to the hospital then, um, this was another sister actually that came and brought me to the hospital, you know, so um, you know, yourself now when you get to hospital, it takes a period of time. It can take, a, you know, a, a lengthy period of time in order to get diagnosed and to go through all the rest, you know. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So the journey, I suppose, from the hospital um, to now, you know, has been long. Uh, it has uh, involved, I suppose, a lot of therapy. Uh, because I lost my speech, then my speech went completely, you know. So um, I had a couple of different admissions to hospital in South Tipperary General, and then I had an admission to um, to uh, Cork University, you know. But I suppose um, the very positive things that to be taken from all of this um, are that, you know, I made such a great recovery. Unfortunately, you sure did. I mean, look at you here today. I mean, you, there's no, um, yeah. Yeah. no speech problems, thank God. Yeah. I have a bit of a delay uh, in my speech, but, you know, I've come very accustomed to that, you know, and, um, you know, at times uh, I get stuck for words and all of that kind of thing. But considering where I've come yeah. from, you know, and um, one of the things that really spurred me on was the fact that I knew that Malala would be coming to Tipperary to receive the International Peace Award at some stage during the year. So this was January, so I knew that I had um, uh, some time to try and, and work hard on getting my speech back. And there were times in the hospital 
when I was very despondent and when I thought, you know, I'm never going to get there. And even a well-meaning visitor uh, to the hospital said to me, you know, oh, you're never going to be able to do your speech making and mm-hmm. present speech award, present the peace award and that. But you uh, proved them wrong. Yes. <laughs> I decided I certainly would be able to do it. And seven months later, um, in August, um, Malala arrived in Tipperary. Uh, she arrived into Shannon and we met her in Shannon and herself and her dad, um, when they learned from my colleague that I had recovered from a stroke, they took huge interest in it and Malala did particularly. And one of the things that she said was that we have something in common, she said. Sure. Because I had to learn uh, to mm. speak again the same as you did, uh, she said to me. And she said uh, when following the shooting, she lost her speech and she lost her hearing and she regained her speech completely and she has a cochlear implant so she her hearing is perfect now as well and uh what a wonderful inspirational story martin i mean it really is i mean it's a, a credit to you that you worked yourself obviously you know when you had a goal and you wanted to do this and i mean the inspiration and the and the parallel between both your stories um it's fascinating what would yeah. you say to people? What would your biggest message p- to people from this episode? What do you want them to, to get out of it? Well, I want awareness. That's the key thing. And that's why I'm doing a lot of public speaking about it. I want people to be stroke aware. You know, um, I could get a, a stroke live on air and yes, nobody uh, would contact me, you know. Nobody would contact me to know how I was or, you know, had something happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't blame people for that at all. But what I'm saying is that awareness is the key. And, you know, the FAST message, you know, the FAST yes. acronym, the face, arms, speech, and time to call, telephone. Um, that's so important, you know, that w- we can all presume... Arthur, you know, they must be feeling under the weather or, you know, they might be too well, uh, but they'll be okay, you know. And it's important, I suppose, that we take the awareness message on board and that we uh, remember that. And, you know, people can get a stroke at any age, at any time. And I'm just blown away, really, by the number of young stroke survivors Right. You know, network on Facebook now, a new network, United for Stroke, um, for young stroke survivors. And I, uh, like, uh, recently I heard on uh, Ryan Tuberty interviewing a young girl who's now 19 who got a stroke at 17. And, you know, babies have got strokes. Uh, so it's not an older person thing. You know, interesting so for us to know that and to be aware of that, Martin, for sure. Yeah, and that's why I'd like people to be aware of that. You know, um, I myself would have associated a stroke with an elderly person, and so know? would I. Yes, but of course, it's not the case. And you know, people should as well be very careful, I suppose, and acknowledge the different, I suppose, markers, you know, the likes of. The blood pressures and the cholesterol and you know things like that are very important for regular checks mm-hmm. you know particularly in relation to blood pressure and cholesterol because but i suppose they, a young person really you know you wouldn't um consider a person a young yeah. person i wouldn't anyway um having to uh, worry about things like their blood pressure or their cholesterol yes. it's not something i personally would associate with a younger person so it's amazing isn't it just it to is. be yes. more health conscious and to be more aware as you say because be more it, your story can help so many people to yes. be aware that even young people to be watching out for signs for our children or for our nephews and nieces or just as you yes. say even if we heard somebody um and were a little bit concerned just to be aware that it's not always things aren't always as they seem and possibly that there is a medical yes situation uh, going on 
I mean, even one of the people in the network uh, was uh, uh, posting during the week uh, saying that she got a stroke as two years of age, you know? So the, the message is it can happen to anybody at any time, you know, and just to be stroke aware and uh, I suppose to look after your health. And, you know, we're all inclined maybe at times to leave things go, I sort of, uh, I leave things go maybe, you know, but uh, yes. messages, you know, yeah, to, to take action the fast action if people wanted to um get in contact with you martin is there a way they can or connect with you um do you yes, want to I, that or? Be delighted and i'm very open to going and telling my story you know right. and uh, i i've been doing that as a couple of different events i had the opportunity to go and speak to cross-party politicians um last week in leinster house wonderful of Senator Trevor O'Tuckertig, and it was great to be able to do that. And uh, certainly people can get me. Uh, I suppose if they email me, it's probably best. Um, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on uh, Facebook, but if they want to email me, it's easy to remember. It's my own name with an S. So it's Martin Quinns as aircom.net. And you're on Twitter as well, Martin. And I'm on Twitter as well. Yes, I should also say that. I am indeed. I spotted you on Twitter because I'm a, a, a Twitter person myself. So yes. yeah, it's, good know those. it's good to know the different platforms that different people are on. Um, and I'll certainly be sharing this Irish Health Hour chats on all the platforms, um, on LinkedIn, on Facebook and on Twitter, um, so that people can listen to this interview and really like, you know, it's great to hear such a positive, inspirational story uh, of of look at you now, what can be done, but also yes. be very honest about what you could have done maybe uh, earlier. Yeah. And I mean, I, I suppose what I say is that life, there is life after stroke, but life has changed. It's not ended, you know, for a lot of us, thankfully. Uh, we're stroke survivors and we survive. You know, my life has changed because I had to give up my job and everything, and that has implications, of obviously. Course. And uh, but I mean, I I keep myself very busy in the community. I do as much as I can. Uh, I try to continue my community work that inspired me when I was young, uh, when I was younger, I suppose, and when I was uh, growing up in in Bansha. And uh, I, I think that spreading the message is very important, you know, getting the message out there Absolutely. to people. <clears throat> yes, that there is support out there. You know, uh, there are stroke support groups, which are fantastic. Uh, apart from the one there on Facebook, there are actual groups that meet and uh, throughout the country in different counties. There's an aphasia, there are aphasia groups. I'm involved in one myself in South Tipperary. So there is great support out there. And, and that's uh, great to know for people. It's great. It's, it's wonderful yeah. for people to know that, Martin. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us and for letting people know, I suppose, too, that there is hope and that there's always a chance that uh, their story can turn out as well as it has for you, albeit your life has changed. But thank God that you're sitting here having this conversation with us, this, with me. This time. It's wonderful. Yes. Thank you very much, Dolores. Thank you very much, Martin, and all the best. And we'll keep in touch. Please God, yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.